It is Friday, July 31st. Let's talk PlayStation. Starting off, as always, with our PlayStation Plus reminder, uh, you only have like four days left to download July's game, so if you haven't done that, go do it. But otherwise, we'll go completely in August, which will be Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 Campaign Remastered and Fall Guys, which, great month all around. You know, it's not going to please everybody, but you've got MW2 in there, which at this point is getting very nostalgic for most people that grew up playing that game, and so because it's a recent release and it came out at 20 bucks. That might be a situation where if you really wanted it, you probably already bought it, but at the very least, that's a great game to be offered. Then you've got Fall Guys, which brand new day and date release on Plus. Not often we see this, and it's actually a game that's getting a lot of positive buzz and reception out of the beta. So totally worth checking out, even if it doesn't look like a game that you'd be interested in. Again, it's, it's on Plus, so at the very least, go try it. But uh, getting into our first news story, uh, PS4 firmware 8.0, that beta we talked about from last week, well, there's an additional feature that Sony added, which is support for authenticator apps. So if you don't want to do the traditional two-step verifications that we've seen, you know, pretty much everywhere else, some sites uh, and some networks also offer third-party authenticator apps, which uh, in Sony's messaging, they made it clear that they don't guarantee if they work 100%, but that is now an option you can use for uh, securing your account on PSN. Next up, here's a story that I never thought we'd be going over on LTPS, but Cuphead is now available on PS4. So, one night prior to this actually going live, we saw it appear on the PlayStation Store, and it was a dead link, so you couldn't follow it anywhere, but essentially we saw it, right, telling us that it's probably going to be made official very soon, and then the following day during a live stream, that's where we got the announcement. And this is also where people were hoping for an update on the planned DLC. Not the case, just the game coming to Sony's console, but either way, that's still great because Cuphead is fantastic. It's one of my favorite games of this generation. It's beautiful, it's it's so challenging, and so it's great to finally have it on PS4 and earn some trophies. It's going to be a very tough platinum. But if you remember three years ago when this game came out on Xbox One, Studio MDHR was pretty forward about the fact that it would never come to PS4, and obviously that's under contractual obligations, and the problem with that is we never know for certain what that contract really is, right? Just that not coming to PS4. However, we do own the IP. So Studio MDHR is independent, although it might have made it seem like just the first game was locked in, not going anywhere. Then we saw it come to, you know, PC, Mac, um, Nintendo Switch most recently, and now PlayStation 4, right? And so it seems like this is something where uh, Studio MDHR might have had a majority stake in the first game, like the ownership of that particular game, and that's where they could leverage it finally coming over after, you know, a certain amount of time has passed. Either way, it's, it's great to have, and so, I mean, if you haven't played this game, I mean, it's, it's totally worth it, but just remember, it's, it is definitely going to be very challenging. Moving on to our next news story, we've got more praise for Ghost of Tsushima, this time coming from the famed Sega director, Toshihiro Nagoshi. He's probably most well known for the Yakuza franchise nowadays, but during a recent Sega livestream, he was very complimentary towards the game, where he said, There's like a notion that Westerners don't understand things about Japan. But that hypothesis itself is mistaken. To be honest, we Japan were beaten. Yeah, of course we're losing. Honestly, I think that's a game that should be made in Japan. He also adds that he's impressed with the performances, but even mentions that Jin as a lead character is not particularly handsome. So what Toshihiro is trying to explain here is that if you were to make this game in Japan and portray Jin as your lead and approach multiple Japanese companies for funding, they might not approve your project just based off of that fact alone which is an unfortunate reality of not only Japan, but just the entertainment and video game industry across multiple countries that try and make any of these products, which is that it's often encouraged to have a very attractive lead regardless of gender, which is really bogus. But what's really surprising here is that, I don't know, I, Jin didn't seem like an ugly character to me. <laughs> like he's modeled after a real person. What are you trying to say about that guy, huh? It's just, I don't know, that caught me off guard. I, maybe I have poor judgment, but like he seems seems handsome to me. Now, if you did not see our Tuesday video, we pretty much covered most of the story, but this past week we saw three new pictures leak online of the PS5 shell and casing and what looks like the production facility for the console. These showed up on the Chinese forum A9VG, and it wasn't so much a question of if they're real or fake, but rather, what can we learn from these pictures? And understandably, a lot of people come to the conclusion that maybe the plates are swappable for different colors. Remember, we do have the UX designer at PlayStation, Matt McLaurin, telling us that PS5 is a very customizable console, so maybe it's something like that. Our Tuesday conversation boiled down to the pictures don't confirm anything. Uh, swapping plates could be up for liability. This could just be for SSD expansion. Maybe it's just not accessible whatsoever. Or if they do offer swappable colors and plates and things like that, We've seen these initiatives before, they never pan out, they usually go away, nobody buys them. 
and that's really still what we're looking at here. Now, some have made the argument that it could be for limited edition consoles, right? So not only do you release a regular PS5 that's special, but you could also sell the plates, and you could easily see Sony getting away with selling them for $100 to $150 with a matching DualSense, coincide it with a, you know, a major Sony IP or whatever major third-party game that's releasing, and maybe that would make sense, right? Because it's in limited batches already, and so it will easily be liquidated one run of production, and that's it. And so uh, th that's like the most viable option I've heard of so far, right? Because if it's just colors like red, blue, black, purple, you know, th that's where it gets muddy, and there's just too much stock, complicates. If you're allowing the bottom shell to get swapped, then you have to offer multiple variations for the digital edition PS5. That's why it just, for the most part, it doesn't work. But if we're talking about how to make this make sense, then that probably might be the best use case. For our next news story, during an earnings call with investors, it was learned that PS5 was a top global trend as revealed from Twitter's chief financial officer, where he was quoted as saying, PlayStation leveraged an 89% global increase in video game conversation on Twitter in late Q1 to build interest and awareness for the PS5. Their successful takeover campaign with a branded emoji, a promoted trend spotlight, and first view resulted in PlayStation being the top global trend with over 1 million mentions over two days and a four times higher engagement rate than the benchmark. Obviously, some interesting, although not at all surprising metrics to look at here. In fact, in a related story, we have 3,000 people that were recently polled uh, during MCM Comic Con's online event, where 84% of participants are more excited for PS5 than Series X. Granted, very small pool of data, but uh, more of a neutral source, right? Depends on where you look for this stuff. But as if what we've seen prior wasn't any sort of indication that that would have been the results, right? Where it doesn't matter where you look, uh, any sort of social media channel, website, there's probably going to be some numbers or data or conversations suggesting that people are obviously more engaged with PlayStation 5 rather than Series X. We can even go beyond what appears like uh, pointless data, right? And look at sales, right? What people are actually buying last three, four, five years of this console generation is pretty indicative of what people are, are really into right now, which is PlayStation, right? Europe is a territory that outsells Xbox three to one, four to one, five to one. It's really quite incredible, right? Japan's a free market. North America is still Microsoft's strongest market. And quite honestly, They've done so well with Series X, I'd imagine that they certainly are still going to have a pretty good foothold in that region. In fact, very possible that, that they could overtake that region. Um, they're not that far behind. The majority of Xbox Ones are sold in America. And so, uh, you know, that's something that could happen for Microsoft. But as we've said time and time again, worldwide numbers going into next gen, they have got the uphill battle, not Sony. Now, moving on, we've got a new report coming out of the official PlayStation Magazine UK that GT7 is being considered a launch window title. And this is notable considering that during the PS5 See the Future event, there was no release window attached to this game. Polyphony hasn't really talked about it. And, you know, for a lot of those games, there were no release windows announced. But even after the event, you know, we learned for a lot of third-party stuff, okay, this is Q1, this is Q2. Uh, even Horizon Forbidden West had an ambiguous 2021 slapped on it. But at least going off of what we know right now, we know that for the See the Future event, Sony only wanted to bring games that were running in engine on PlayStation 5. Sony's first party has understandably had dev kits much longer than most other developers. Polyphony specifically uh, always likes to benchmark some of their games on Sony's new hardware, so we know that they are probably one of the earliest studios to really get their hands on it. And, uh, you know, barring some of the third party announcements like Project Athia, where that could be 2024 for all we know. Uh, it seems like most of Sony's first party or just PlayStation Studios, including some of that second party, a lot of that seems lined up for the first year to two years of PS5, right? Because still a lot of Sony's developers are very busy working on their upcoming PS5 projects or some of them have wrapped up PS4 projects within the last year to two years. So we know we're going to have to do some serious waiting for a lot of these games that are expected 2022 and beyond. So I suspect that a lot of the titles that we already saw during the See the Future event is really within that first year and a half, two years. So worst case scenario, GT7 might not be that far away. And I know this is somewhat outlandish, but what I cannot seem to forget is that one of the very earliest PS5 rumors we ever had was a pastebin post claiming that GT7 was going to be a launch window title. And, uh, you know, it's amazing to even say that, but uh, we've actually had pastebin examples well beyond the console launch where they were kind of accurate, right? And so it seems 
all along that GT7 was probably pegged to be one of the earliest PS5 titles. That's not to say it's launch window, but I think it will come much sooner than people are probably expecting. Another thing that we recently learned from a different magazine, this time Game Informer, is that allegedly Spider-Man Miles Morales comes with a remastered version of the original Spider-Man on PlayStation 4. And so somebody on Reddit noticed this in their Game Informer issue where it specifically states, Miles Morales isn't a traditional sequel since it comes bundled with a remastered version of Insomniac Spider-Man that takes full advantage of the PS5 hardware. So this might just be another misnomer or miscommunication or misunderstanding or poor writing. It seems pretty obvious that they would have made that pretty clear. Uh, this might just go back to the miscommunication efforts we saw between Insomniac and the press when they originally announced Miles Morales during the See the Future event, right? Where nobody really knew what this game was, and a Sony rep even clarified it in the wrong way up until Insomniac stepped forward and said, look, it's its own game, this is his own story, it's a little shorter, about half the length of the original game, and uh, it's not really an expansion, it's meant to be its own single-player start-to-finish story as Spider-Man, uh, the Miles Morales character, right? So in all likelihood, that's probably what's happening here, not that they're bundling a larger game with a smaller game and then not mentioning anything about it, because that would be significant news that you'd want to tell people. I don't think they need to save it for anything. I think what most people are expecting at this point is gameplay for Spider-Man Miles Morales, the game that they actually announced, right? So it, it just doesn't really add up or, or make sense. Um, I really wouldn't expect this game to come bundled with the first game. For our next news story, we've got a new Sony patent to go over, and this one actually is relatively new, where it was filed over a year ago and published about two weeks ago. It's called Information Processing Device, and what this essentially describes is almost like a DLSS type feature, where if you don't know, DLSS stands for Deep Learning Super Sampling. That's NVIDIA's proprietary technology, where it's a reconstruction method, so kind of like checkerboard rendering, where the main goal of it is to save GPU performance by producing what looks like a 4K quality image without actually rendering it in that native 4K resolutions, right? So that's what this patent is basically describing. It's the same method because obviously Sony can't like support DLSS. They're coming up with their own method in this uh, scenario. And the key differences would be how the reconstruction method actually takes place, right? Because you might wonder, why doesn't Sony just do more checkerboard rendering? Well, you get different results and it's done in a different manner. So for checkerboard rendering, you're rendering half the pixels and then you're using things like uh, interpolation or temporal filtering to fill in the rest. Whereas DLSS is using machine learning. So it's looking at the previous few frames and it's using that AI to guesswork where lines and sharpness and clearness needs to go. And uh, for the 2.0 version of DLSS, there are some amazing results there. And ironically, because of the recent release of Death Stranding, Digital Foundry just put out a fantastic video showcasing the differences of a PS4 Pro with Death Stranding using checkerboard rendering, which mind you, Death Stranding uses checkerboard rendering in a slightly different manner but they compare that to the recent PC release and using DLSS there. And you can see some, not drastic differences, but certainly uh, one of the biggest problems with uh, checkerboard rendering is that it has a problem filling in a lot of the blanks with what would be, you know, lines, text, distances can look a little warped and wobbled, kind of like old PS1 textures. And uh, over on DLSS, it clears a lot of that up. But one of the faults of DLSS is uh, there can be ghosting on certain objects depending on you know, depending on what the object actually is. I'm going to link this video down below because if you want to really get into this stuff, go check that out. But the main goal of both of these things is to save GPU performance, right? And so actually rendering something in native 4K, especially for a lot of these very graphically intensive games, you know, it, it takes a lot of hardware, right? And that's why there's these expectations that need to be in check for going into next gen with PS5 and Series X when it comes to resolutions and certainly frame rate, right? That's why we're seeing you know, performance settings being offered because quite frankly, you're not going to get this best case scenario of a 4K 60 game and it looks as beautiful as The Last of Us Part 2. Not going to happen. You know, there's there's got to be compromises. Even on PC, there's compromises unless you shell out just boatloads of cash, but most people don't even do that there. So it's cool that Sony's looking into this. At least that's how the patent is, is sounding. Um, it's no confirmation of anything. But obviously, Sony having the patent means they have shown interest, but they're a big corporation, and like any, they'll file thousands of patents only to use 1% of them. So it's no guarantee, but we have seen really incredible results out of DLSS 2.0, that recent uh, update, and uh, really cleans up the image good. And that's what's important, is that you can get close to native 4K, a great picture quality, 
not spend much on the GPU front and for consoles that's always so important because uh, you're working with a closed environment so you really have to squeeze as much as you can out of them. Moving on to Project Athia, the Square Enix PS5 exclusive that was announced during the PS5 See the Future event. Uh, very light on details for this game, we don't know much about it, but just recently the uh, Square Enix president Yosuke Matsuda was speaking to a Japanese publication where he confirmed it's an open world game, and they've actually doubled down on their commitment to developing on high-end platforms like PS5, where he was quoted as saying, PS5 dramatically improves video technology, such as with the implementation of light reflecting ray tracing technology. Compared to what you see on PC, it is nearly identical. By utilizing these special traits, we're able to create incredibly precise imagery. We still plan on developing well-balanced games tailored to a platform's traits, including smartphone and cloud-based games, but we will never stop developing for high-end platforms such as PS5 because these things are packed with the best technology. Yeah, you know, Project Athia did look incredible, right? It looked fantastic, but therein lies the problem where you watch the footage and you can't help but think, okay, well one, this is Square Enix, so how long is this gonna take? And two, how much of a visual downgrade is this reasonably going to see, especially now learning that it's an open world game, right? It's just so early to have any sort of viable opinion on what we saw because it's just going to be so far out, right? And so now learning that it's open world just tells me even more, okay, how much further out is it going to be? And what will this really look like once it hits retail? So, I mean, I'm excited and I, I can't wait to see more, but you can't help but think those things when you, when you look at that footage. Next up, the website Game Reactor put up a preview for the game WRC9 and then promptly pulled it down, and I'm not entirely sure why, because it's being paraded around as though they revealed information they weren't supposed to, and maybe it was just the publisher's problem, I don't know. But what was in the article was that there is a confirmed free upgrade from PS4 to PS5 for this game, WRC9. Good to hear, but uh, what other sites are reporting is new information, which it's not, but is that uh, this game will f take advantage of PS5's uh, activities feature for deep links to specific parts of that game. So if you didn't know, this is pretty much one of the first pieces of information we ever knew about PS5 from the Wired articles, which is that you don't even have to boot up a game to see information about a game. So kind of like PS4's, you know, live area for a game which doesn't have all that useful of information just trophy stuff and you know friends playing it and live streams and whatnot but on ps5 it'll be you know information about active online lobbies or uh missions you're working on races you're working on just things within the context of that game and what you can do is click on those things and it will jump you right to that specific portion of the game so you're kind of booting past whatever sort of traditional sequence the game might have going skipping all the menus inside the game going right to that portion of a title so it's not new information although the article describes that wrc9 will will feature this for races so cool but um not new but either way still nice to hear now this next one i'm not gonna lie i found it somewhat humorous just given the situation which is that uh, the co-founder and president of valve gabe newell was on vacation in New Zealand on a New Zealand talk show talking about his vacation and then they were asking him about his vacation but also about VR stuff and then the question came up of hey PS5 Series X which you know should people get and right away he said Xbox I think they asked him like you know why or something like that or is it better and he said oh because it is and then he followed up quickly saying I have no stake in this race you know Valve makes PC software but I would definitely go with the Xbox basically what he said right and, uh, you know, the thing is, what we have here is a guy that, well, one, Valve barely even ships PC games, much less console games. So this is really just a man voicing his personal preference to a bunch of people that don't even seem super into video games. I don't know, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. I don't know these people, but this was just a, a casual conversation about preferences vocalized. But of course, it turns into something beyond that where it's, you know, a console debate. Really, it's just a guy, because clearly he has an Xbox preference. That's not really much of a surprise. I highly doubt there's anything much to discuss here, even accounting for the, the PS3 baggage back in the day, which that was like highly publicized back then, but they were shipping on consoles back then. Um, so there's really not much to say here. I mean, yeah, there's Half-Life Alex that could come to PSVR someday, but that would probably have to be on PlayStation 5 for a next-gen PSVR 2, and Valve's a you know business. They'll, they'll ship if they're going to make money on it. So let's talk about this rumored August event. We have a lot of things to rattle off here, so no separate news stories. We'll just knock these out one by one. Starting with Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. This was leaked from a Doritos bag. Now one, that's hilarious, but two, there's a strong Sony affiliation there, so we know that at some point that's probably gonna be part of Sony's thing in some way, shape, or form. Two, we have Rely on Horror that is reporting that we'll get a new trailer for Resident Evil Village very soon, that there was a recent play test 
for uh, some people and that there's a VR mode that they can't talk about until Sony talks about it. So there might be some sort of connection there. We've got a number of people on Twitter acting as though they're insiders saying, we'll see this soon, we'll see that soon. Hey, the trailers are, are coming soon. We'll see pre-order soon. As if that isn't obvious, we're in August. Of course, these things are coming soon. So I don't know, just a little mini rant there. Too many people doing this. Um, nobody knows anything. Maybe they've got second, third hand information. But at this point, you have to figure that almost all of it is just them trying to act as though they're close enough to the information to appear that they're right. Then we've got Corey Barlog, which by accident, I don't, I don't know if he did it on purpose or by accident, uh, he retweeted what was a fake tweet announcing the August 6th state of play, right? As of right now, nothing's confirmed, but he retweeted that, then deleted it. Now keep in mind, <clears throat> actually most of Sony's first party and most developers would not know about when the date for that event would actually be, right? Remember, from a reliable source, we learned that uh, even Sony's own teams, uh, developers that were part of the show, did not know when that event was happening and that it was a moving target. So uh, I highly doubt that anyone else really knows about this uh, upcoming event. Maybe that was by mistake. Uh, we had one YouTube channel, uh, Moore's Law is Dead, where he claimed he had heard that God of War is gonna be at this next, um, this next state of play and that's coming for 2021 there's gonna be like a slight teaser there or something and then there's another game that will be available at launch that mark cerny is working on Corey barlog responded to somebody on twitter pretty much with a gif making it seem as though that's definitely not going to happen keep in mind god of war ship 2018 there is no reason we should be seeing any sort of cinematic trailer for God of War 2 or the sequel or whatever, right? Whatever they decide to call it, we don't need a teaser or a trailer. If it comes in 2021, that would be very impressive, but I doubt that's going to happen. Despite the fact that we also heard that the game won't take five years to come out, but it's, I don't know, three seems pretty ambitious considering that how crazy the game looks and is, and uh, they're working on brand new hardware. So let's not expect that either. Then we've got two uh, recent 4chan leaks. I believe they're both on 4chan where they're claiming all the content of this upcoming event in this August state of play and time and time again we've seen all these posts be completely bogus where who's going to have exact information of every single announcement that's there I'll display them to you I'm not going to read them off we're not going to get into this because uh, I think both of them have some pretty revealing evidence that they're not real like uh, one of them calls the Call of Duty wrong and then one of them has Days Gone 2 in there as a cinematic trailer. Days Gone shipped last year. What are you doing announcing Days Gone 2? That's not going to happen. Just keep all that in mind. Yes, more information is soon. Another event is soon. It could be August 6th. It could be August 13th. I mean, these are solid guesses, and that's the problem. Most people probably don't know anything. We're close enough to the event. There's a lot of believable claims. People are going to appear like they're correct, but probably most people don't know much. Next up, we've got a report out of Digitimes that one of Sony's back-end suppliers in Taiwan is expecting that the overall life cycle of PS5 to be about five years with around 120 to 170 million units being manufactured. So that's a pretty large number, of course, right? Uh, the upper echelon being 170, which would make PlayStation 5 the most successful video game console ever. I don't really expect that, and I don't expect it in a five-year time frame. But uh, I can see it matching PS4 numbers, which as of right now, the console's probably creeping very close to around 120. Um, probably after the holiday season, it'll just barely get to 120. And that would put it above the next platform, which would be Game Boy. So not quite a traditional console, but the Game Boy is at 118 million units. And uh, five years would be a shorter life cycle than what we've previously seen with this generation and the uh, seventh generation. So this actually goes into the PS4 Pro conversation, or excuse me, PS5 Pro conversation, if you remember when we did that video, where uh, Albert Pinello made the case that we might not see a PS5 Pro. And uh, the reasoning there could be that, uh, you know, advancements just won't come fast enough at a reasonable pace in terms of the price to actually build a PS5 Pro. It might not line up with any sort of new standard for display resolutions. And, uh, you know, if need be, Sony would just do PlayStation 6 at that point and go into a new generation. As we've learned, they believe in traditional console generations. And uh, despite us getting a digital edition PS5, PS Now, Stadia, xCloud, I mean, we're probably going to have another tradi traditional console generation. So um, it was five years is not that long to some people. So, um, but 120 to 170, I mean, it's, it's a huge number, but I can certainly see PS5 doing that. Also, if you did not see, there's going to be an upcoming documentary on PlayStation hardware called From Bedrooms to Billions. 
uh, the PlayStation Revolution. This was kickstarted over four years ago and it finally got a release date in September. And so this is a very premium high quality documentary, not like the little ones that I do, but a lot of interviews with some prominent people. You got Mark Cerny in there. So it looks really cool. Definitely going to be something that you're going to want to pay attention to when it comes out. There's probably going to be a lot of really cool anecdotes and information about PlayStation history, how it came to be, things that we've never heard of before. So I, for one, am pumped about it because as somebody that makes little documentaries here, I'm excited to see all, all that stuff. With all that out of the way, it's time to get to Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you could win a $10 PSN code. I'd like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. If you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very simple. Follow the link down below. Support on this channel in a number of ways can gain you an entry, and I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to pay for your games. Those are all the news stories that I want to talk about you all. Like I mentioned, our Tuesday video was the PS5 shell and case leak. We elaborate on that. But also we had a conversation about PS Now and PS Plus. How can those get better on PS5 in their own right? Not comparing it to Game Pass. You can't easily compare them and we've already done a video on that already. So uh, check that conversation out. Like I mentioned last week, we'll get to more frequent uploads soon. At this point, um, a lot of unboxing because what I normally do with those type of videos is if I know I have a lot of things coming, I'll film it all at once and then I just have to decide when I edit and upload them. And so now I've let, I've let too many things bank up so those will start getting uploaded pretty soon. And uh, for now, at least that's it. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Vanecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me and I will see you all next Friday.